In our discussion on the primary structure of polypeptides, we said that it's the primary structure, it's that specific sequence of amino acids in that polypeptide that ultimately determines what the final three-dimensional conformation of the polypeptide is. Now the question is, how exactly do we know that and how did we discover this important fact about proteins in biochemistry? Well, basically in 1950s, an American chemist by the name of Christian Anthenson conducted a series of important experiments that demonstrated that all the information that we need to basically form that three-dimensional structure of the polypeptide is found, is stored in the specific sequence of amino acids within that polypeptide. And later experiments confirmed the fact that the primary structure determines that conformation of that protein. Now, before we actually examine what these experiments were, let's take a look at some important molecules and reagents that he used in his experiment. So, he used two important denaturing agents. Denaturing agents are these molecules that basically break down the structure of our protein. So, he used urea and beta mercaptoethanol. Now, urea is basically used to break down the non-covalent bonds, such as hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds that hold together that secondary structure of the protein as well as parts of the tertiary structure. And he used beta mercaptoethanol to basically break down the covalent bonds, the disulfide bonds that exist and hold that tertiary structure of the protein together. So, beta mercaptoethanol uses an oxidation reduction reaction. So this itself is oxidized and it reduces the disulfide bonds. It breaks them down. It breaks down the cysteine units into the two individual cysteine amino acids, as we'll see in just a moment. So together, these two agents can be used to denature, to break down the tertiary and secondary structure of our protein. Now, the next question is, what protein did Christian actually use? Well, Christian used a ribonuclease, which is basically an enzyme, a protein, that catalyzes the breaking down of RNA molecules in the cells of organisms. And this particular protein has 124 amino acids in its primary sequence, and in the tertiary structure, it contains four individual disulfide bonds. So we have one bond between the 26th and the 84th cysteine amino acid. We have a second bond between the 40th and 95th. We have a third bond between the 65th and 72nd. And we have the final bond between the 58th and 110th cysteine amino acid in our ribonuclease. And this three-dimensional structure, this conformation basically describes the native conformation of that ribonucleus. The native structure describes the biologically active structure of our enzyme. Now, the next question is, what did he actually want to do with these different molecules? Well, the plan was to destroy the tertiary and the secondary structures of the ribonuclease by using these appropriate agents and then to see under which conditions did the, uh, did the native structure of that ribonuclease basically reform. So now let's take a look at these three experiments. Let's begin with experiment number one. In experiment number one, he took that active ribonuclease enzyme that contains this secondary and tertiary structure and he placed it, he mixed it with an excess amount of beta mercaptoethanol and a large amount of urea, so eight molar concentration of urea. So what happened is the excess beta mercaptoethanol broke down all those covalent disulfide bonds. So it, break it broke down down this bond, this bond, this bond, and this bond. And the urea broke down the non-covalent interactions that hold parts of the tertiary and the secondary structure together. So at the end, we basically form the following denatured enzyme, the enzyme that is not in its active form. 
Now, what he did next was, by using a semi-permeable membrane, he removed these two agents at the same exact time. So he isolated this denatured enzyme by removing these two agents at the same time. And eventually he saw what happened is because this denatured enzyme was in the presence of oxygen, the oxygen in the air was able to basically reform those disulfide bonds. So it oxidized those disulfide bonds, reformed those disulfide bonds, and eventually, because the urea was also removed at the same time, the non-covalent interactions also reformed, and we reformed the proper secondary and tertiary structure of that particular enzyme. So initially we place this native enzyme with access beta mercaptoethanol and 8 molar urea and what happens is our enzyme is denatured. But when the denaturing agents were removed via the process of dialysis by using a semi-permeable membrane, the enzyme eventually reformed its original tertiary structure. Now, what this basically shows is it gives us evidence that it's the primary sequence, it's the primary structure, it's that specific sequence of amino acids that essentially dictates the proper formation of the tertiary structure of that enzyme. Now, let's move on to experiment two and see what experiment two was. In experiment two, he basically took that beaker that contained our denatured enzyme as well as the excess beta mercaptoethanol and our urea. And instead of removing these two agents at the same exact time, he first removed the beta uh, mercaptoethanol and then after some time, he removed that urea. What he found was the enzyme that was formed was not in its biologically active state. In fact, this enzyme was scrambled. It contained the incorrect pairing of disulfide bonds. So what we mean by that is this native active biologically active form of the enzyme contains these pairings, these disulfide bonds. So for example, the first one is between the 26th and the 84th amino acid. But here, the first bond is formed between the 26th and the 40th. And so that means this will contain the improper linkages between our cysteine molecules and that will create an inactive molecule. Now, the question is, why did, that, uh, why did that actually take place? Well, the answer is simple. It's the primary sequence, it's that uh, specific sequence of amino acids in that polypeptide that basically dictates the type of non-covalent interactions that will exist on that polypeptide. And it's these non-covalent interactions that basically drive the correct formation of our disulfide bonds. So if these non-covalent interactions cannot exist in that polypeptide, then that polypeptide has no way of knowing what the proper disulfide bonds are that have to be formed. And so what happened in this experiment was because we initially removed the beta mercaptoethanol before actually removing our urea, we saw that in our denatured mixture, we had the urea, so the non-covalent bonds could not actually form and they could not actually drive the correct formation of those disulfide bonds. And so because we had urea in the mixture, improper, incorrect disulfide bonds were actually formed. So when the beta mercaptoethanol was removed first, an inactive enzyme was formed. And this is because the improper disulfide bonds were formed because those non-covalent interactions could not basically dictate the formation of those proper disulfide pairings. Now let's move on to experiment number three. So in experiment number three, what he saw is 
if he took this scrambled enzyme and he added a tiny amount of beta mercaptoethanol. So basically we have a beaker that contains our scrambled enzyme and we don't have any type of agent inside that beaker. And now we add a trace amount of beta mercaptoethanol. So what he found was because we had a tiny bit amount of this catalyst, this catalyst essentially catalyzed the breakage of these incorrectly paired disulfide bonds and eventually because of thermodynamics we formed this native enzyme now what that means is it's the conformation it's the structure of that native enzyme that is the most stable thermodynamically and it's because of this that we have the breaking of these bonds and eventually the formation of this native structure so if we take the scrambled enzyme and we add a tiny amount of beta mercaptoethanol the beta mercaptoethanol will basically break these incorrectly paired disulfide bonds and eventually because this this is the most thermodynamically stable structure this structure will form and he saw that after about 10 hours this structure did in fact reform so these were the experiments that were conducted by Christian Anfinson in the 1950s that eventually showed that it's the primary structure it's that specific sequence of amino acids inside that polypeptide that eventually gives us the information to form that final three-dimensional structure of that polypeptide.